Ever feel like uh, you're going down one of those internet rabbit holes? Yeah. You know? no. <laughs> That's kind of where we're headed today, diving into the mystery of Satoshi Nakamoto. Ah, Satoshi Nakamoto, mm -hmm. the Bitcoin creator. The mystery that's captivated the world, really, for over a decade now, and still no definitive answers. And to make it even more interesting, we're going to bring in another intriguing figure, Len Sassaman. Right, Len Sassaman. An American cryptographer that some believe might be connected to Bitcoin's origins. We've got excerpts from Wikipedia articles about both Satoshi and Sassaman, and we're going to deep dive into those today. That was good. So to start, what do we know about Sassaman and what makes him a potential candidate in the whole Satoshi mystery? Well, it's really interesting. When you look at his life's work, it seems almost intertwined with the core principles of Bitcoin. I mean, we're talking about someone who wasn't just academically brilliant, but a true advocate for digital privacy at a time when it, well, it wasn't really a mainstream concern. Yeah, this wasn't someone just reading about cryptography in textbooks. He was out there living it. He maintained something called the Mixmaster Anonymous Remailer Code. So basically, imagine a system where messages are bounced around so much that their origin is almost impossible to trace. Yeah, good luck tracking that down. Right. It's like like trying to track a letter that's been through dozens of anonymous forwarding addresses all over the world. Wow. That's the level of anonymity we're talking about here. And it wasn't just Mixmaster, right? He was also involved with Anonymizer, another tool for cluking online activity. Yeah, and he even did some really interesting work on something called X.509 Certificate Authority Infrastructure Attacks. Okay, breaking that down, what does that even mean? So in simple terms, he was finding vulnerabilities in the systems that we use every day to verify identities online. Mm -hmm. He was basically saying, hey, the way we do digital identity is flawed, and here's why. Interesting. And this wasn't just theoretical for him either. He was a self-proclaimed cypherpunk. A cypherpunk? What is that? C cypherpunks were these individuals who believed that cryptography was the key to social and political change. They saw the potential for technology to really empower individuals and you know, challenge those traditional power structures. Interesting. So we're talking about someone who is very privacy focused, fighting for individuals, very tech savvy, believed in the power of cryptography. Exactly. And his actions weren't limited to the digital world. He was very vocal, involved in protests, really pushing for greater transparency and accountability from from governments and corporations. It wasn't just about code for this guy. So this is someone who walks the walk, right? This isn't just talk. Oh, yeah. He was about about building a better world. He really was. And this brings us to the Bitcoin connection. Because one really compelling piece of evidence, at least for some people, is that there's a memorial to Sassaman embedded within the Bitcoin blockchain. It's true. It really makes you wonder, was this a tribute from Satoshi, a knowing nod to, to a kindred spirit? You know? Yeah, especially when you consider the timing of his disappearance from public life. It's strikingly close to Bitcoin's emergence, almost as if... Uh, it's like he disappears into the ether just as this revolutionary technology appears. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's uncanny. It really does make you think, like, what happened there? But as captivating as Sassaman's story is, it's only one thread in this whole Satoshi mystery. So let's let's shift our focus a little bit to the mysterious creator himself, Satoshi Nakamoto. Right, because even though we don't know their true identity we can kind of trace their impact through what they left behind. Exactly. And I think the most telling artifact is the Bitcoin white paper itself. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which it wasn't just a technical document. It's like it was a statement wow. about the flaws of the traditional financial system. And whoever wrote this clearly understood not just cryptography, but economics and and the potential for these decentralized systems to really disrupt things. So they took these like cypherpunk ideals and actually made it into something real. Yeah. But the white paper itself doesn't really give us a lot to go on as far as like personal details about Satoshi. No, it's true. It's it's almost as if they anticipated the frenzy that their creation would spark and, you know, intentionally obscured any identifying information. Wow. But they did leave some clues. Okay. Particularly in those early days in their online activity. And what? For example, we've talked about the name, right? Yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto. Sounds Japanese. Right. But if you analyze the timestamps of their forum posts, they're they're not consistent with someone actually living in Japan. Yeah. They were most active during during hours. That would be very unusual for someone residing in Japan. So if they were in Japan, where were they? Well, the timestamps seem to point to somewhere in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. Possibly in the United States or Europe. 
It just deepens the mystery. It does. And it makes you wonder, could Satoshi Nakamoto be more than one person? It's a good question. Right. Like a group of developers all using the same name. It's a theory that a lot of people have, especially when you consider just how complex Bitcoin's code is. Yeah. I mean, it required deep knowledge of cryptography, distributed systems, economics. To imagine one single person pulling off something like this, even if they were a total genius, it's hard. It's a lot. It would be like like trying to build a skyscraper, right. but you're also designing the foundation and the plumbing and the electrical wiring all at the same time by yourself. Yeah, that's not happening. Yeah. So if we think about it, if it was multiple people, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Right. Like, were they a group within that cypherpunk community, all united by this shared vision? Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. But whether it was one mind or many, this whole quest to unmask Satoshi has become a global treasure hunt at this point. Oh, yeah. It totally has. And over the years, there have been a bunch of names that have come up as potential candidates. A lot of speculation. So let's, let's dive into some of those. Okay, yeah. We've got Hal Finney, who was if I remember correctly, like a, a cryptography pioneer. Yeah, he was one of the very first people, besides Nakamoto, to actually use Bitcoin. Oh, right. He was really involved in cryptography, a true pioneer. So what makes him a likely candidate in your mind? Well, he certainly had the skills. Yeah. And, and analysis of their writing styles, Finney's and Nakamoto's, has shown that, that Finney's communication with Nakamoto was more similar to Nakamoto's style than his own usual writing. It's like their digital voices were like, merging in a way. It's kind of spooky, actually. Yeah, it's strange. But unfortunately, Finney passed away in 2014. He did. Which, you know, adds another layer to this whole thing. It does. Okay, so next up, we have a name that I always thought was a little too on the nose, Dorian Nakamoto. Right, Dorian. It was huge in the media when it came out. Right, it was everywhere. But despite sharing the name, Dorian Nakamoto, who actually did have a background in technology, denied being Satoshi. Okay, so that one kind of fizzled out. Yeah, it did. All right, so let's move on to someone who I think is a much more interesting candidate, Nick Sabo. Okay. And the reason I think he's so interesting is because of his work on BitGold. Right, BitGold. It was a precursor to Bitcoin in a lot of ways. He was dealing with things like double spending, which Bitcoin ultimately solved. So BitGold was kind of like the early prototype for Bitcoin in a way. Yeah, I mean, it laid the groundwork. Yeah. And Sabo has denied being Satoshi, but the similarities between his work and Bitcoin, it's hard to ignore them. It is. Yeah. So you've got this guy, he understands the challenges of a decentralized digital currency, and he's chosen to be anonymous in the past. Right. It definitely raises some eyebrows. But without any hard evidence, it's just speculation at this point. Okay, so we've talked about Finney, we've talked about Dorian, we've talked about Sabo. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room, the person who has very loudly and publicly proclaimed to be Satoshi, Craig Wright. Right, Craig Wright. That's that's a whole other story. It really is. He claims to have proof, but a lot of experts have said, nope, they haven't been convinced. And it's not just that people don't believe him. He's gone to court over this. Yeah, he's taken legal action. And even a UK court ruled that he is not Satoshi. Yeah. And yet he maintains this claim. So it makes it hard to know what to believe. It really does. I feel like the deeper you go, the less clear it all becomes. So my question is, with all these different theories, is it even possible to prove definitively one way or the other? That's the million dollar question, or should I say the multi-billion dollar question. Yeah. It given Bitcoin's value these days. That's true. It really makes you wonder. I mean, you would think that with all the advancements we've made in technology, we'd be closer to actually figuring this out. You'd think so. But it almost seems like the more we dig into it, the more we learn about all these different theories and the evidence, mm. the more confusing it gets. It does make you think, like, are we even any closer now than we were 10 years ago? But, you know, something I've always wondered about this is if this person or people if they wanted to stay anonymous, why not just be totally silent? Right. Why insert themselves into the community, engage in discussions, and then just disappear? Well, some people think that whoever it was, maybe they really did just want to see Bitcoin succeed. Okay. That they participated early on just to kind of kind of guide the ship a little, nurture that early community, make sure that it, you know, stayed true to what they envisioned. Like they were laying the groundwork and then they were like, okay, it's good now. Yeah, got I can it. walk away. Exactly. Or 
Here's another thought. Maybe it was all part of the plan. Like a very calculated disappearing act that was meant to, to solidify this idea of decentralization. By removing themselves completely, they ensure that nobody, no single entity would ever be able to control it. It's true. Nobody can control Bitcoin. Right. It becomes this truly decentralized system that belongs to yeah everybody and nobody. So are we saying it's like performance art? Well, I mean, think about it. What better way to really solidify this idea, this mystique of Bitcoin, than by shrouding its origins in mystery? True. Right. It's it's a story that really captures your imagination. It makes people debate, and it definitely ensures that Bitcoin stays in the public consciousness. It's true. It's like a modern-day legend, this whole thing. It is. But regardless of the why, could we ever really know for sure? Like, wh what would it even take to definitively prove someone is Satoshi? Right, and that's the big question. Right. Some people say that the only way would be if Satoshi themselves came forward. Okay. Maybe by moving some of that early Bitcoin mm -hmm. or or using the private key associated with the very first block, what's called the Genesis block. It's like that secret knock that gets you into the club. Exactly. Right. But even then, wouldn't there be people who didn't believe it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's the thing about this. I mean, you're always going to have doubt, skepticism. People are going to say it's faked, it's manipulated. Right. And it's really hard to argue with that because it's it's cryptography, digital identities. It's a breeding ground for these conspiracy theories. It is. It's a lot. So I guess we're kind of back to where we started, huh? Yeah, in a way. More questions than answers. Yeah. But maybe that's the point. Maybe. I mean, it makes us really think about this idea of identity innovation and what even is truth in this, you know, crazy digital world that we're living in. It does. Well said. Thank you. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our deep dive. We've gone through it all. <laughs> Len Sassaman, the different Satoshi candidates. We went deep. We did. A lot to process. We didn't find any definitive answers, uh -huh. but that's okay. Yeah. Because maybe it's really about the journey, right? Exactly. Maybe it's not about the destination. Sometimes the most interesting discoveries are the ones that you make along the way. Very well said. And who knows, maybe one of our listeners will be the one to crack the code. Maybe. Until then, keep those thinking caps on, and we'll be back next time with another deep dive.